Greetings to our audience today. My name is Rahul Parson, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies. And it is my privilege and honor to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Professor Ananya Vajpayee. And the event is entitled, The Ever-Falling Darkness of History, Tagorean Visions of Aesthetics and Politics. Uh, today's talk is being presented under the aegis of the Tagore Program on Literature, Culture, and Philosophy at UC Berkeley. The program was launched in fall of 2020, the first of its kind in the US. The Tagore Tagore program is designed to showcase the life and legacy of Rabindranath Tagore. The program will sponsor talks and workshops on Tagore, as well as other public events. It will also fund a semester long visiting professorship in Tagore studies at UC Berkeley. Our inaugural visiting professor will be Dr. Shukanto Chaudhary, an Indian literary scholar who is a professor emeritus at Jadavpur University. In the spring of uh, 2022, Dr. Chaudhary will teach a six part virtual course titled Rabindranath Tagore and the Aesthetics of Political Engagement and give a public talk on Rabindranath Tagore and the synergy of the arts, hopefully in person. Links to all of these events will be shared with the audience in the chat box. In brief, today's event will, will include a 45 minute talk by Dr. Vajpai. Uh, followed by a question and answer session. Uh, the audience uh, is invited to submit questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, and then at the, at the end of this program, we will uh, read these questions and <clears throat> Dr. Vajpay will have an opportunity to answer them. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Ananya Vajpay is an associate professor at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies. Uh, she received her PhD in South Asian Languages and Civilizations from the University of Chicago. Pre before that, an MPhil from the University of Oxford, and before that, an MA from JNU, and a BA from Lady Sri, La Sri Ram College. <clears throat> All, of course, very prestigious institutions. Professor Vajpai's publication list runs six pages. And so I won't take up much of our time today by, by going over them, but I want to flag up the, the book, the very important book from which uh, this talk emerges, Righteous Republic, The Political Foundations of Modern India by Harvard University Press, 2012. In Righteous Republic, uh, Dr. Vajpayee discusses five of the most important founding figures, Gandhi, Rabindranath Tagore, Obindranath Tagore, the latter two uh, forming the, the content of today's talk, Nehru and Ambedkar. Dr. Vajpayee looks at how each of them in turn turns to classical texts in order to form, in, in order to fashion an original sense of Indian selfhood. In Righteous Republic, a portrait emerges of a group of innovative, synthetic, and cosmopolitan thinkers who succeed in braiding together two Indian knowledge traditions, one political, and concerned with social questions and the other religious and oriented towards transcendence. With their vast intellectual and aesthetic and moral inheritance, the founders searched for different aspects of the self that would allow India to come into its own as a modern nation state. The new Republic they envisaged would embody both India's struggle for sovereignty and a quest for the self. In a sense, uh, Dr. Vajpayee asks the question, uh, where is the swa or what is the swa in Swaraj? Dr. Vajpayee's work is that at the intersection of intellectual history, political theory, and critical philo philology. So with no further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Vajpayee to, to the stage and join us for her talk. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, Rahul. Um, it's really a pleasure to, to speak uh, on this, uh, at the and to um, <clears throat> um, and to address uh, students, faculty, and friends uh, at Berkeley, um, I was asked by um, um, by uh, your fellow faculty members to specifically address 
um, Tagore and Tagorean themes in my work. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. And, and as you correctly surmised, I'll be speaking uh, from, um, from my book, from the, from the couple of chapters in my book that, uh, that dealt with uh, Rabindranath and Abhinindranath Tagore. Um, I, when I was when I was writing this book and and after it came out, um, um, many people uh, asked me why I included um, non-political figures, not directly political figures, uh, artists uh, like the two Tagores, uh, in my list of sort of founding fathers of the republic and. Um, you know, I felt that it, it was very, very important to have a, um, um, uh, an accounting of, of uh, the, the sort of aesthetic um, component of this quest for selfhood and sovereignty, Swaraj, um, well, which, which, uh, which was an amalgamation, uh, not just of, um, you know, directly uh, and, and, and straightforwardly political ideas, but um, really uh, an attempt to come to terms with uh, a very complex history um, uh, and a very complex aesthetic field um, that, uh, that, that would go into the making of this new nation. So uh, the Tagores in a sense were, were actually central to, um, uh, to the entire project of uh, envisioning uh, this this new idea of India. Um, in today's talk, I'm going to <clears throat> look at uh, Rabindranath and Abhinindranath um, Tagore. I will look at uh, poems, uh, essays, paintings by both of them, and um, you know the way it's uh, done in the book is uh, through the through a sort of close reading um, of 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 these different kinds of texts, uh, both visual and um, uh, poetic, as well as uh, you know uh, prose uh, writings. Um, and I mean, the kind of reading that I've done doesn't really lend itself in any straightforward way to. Uh, uh, a, a, a PowerPoint presentation. So, but but what I've tried to do is put uh, on some slides some of the artwork that I'm referring to, um, as well as quotations from 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 the poems that uh, I'm going to be talking about. Um, and um, I hope that you know these these are not sort of arranged in any kind of narrative but they will provide a sort of uh, a visual counterpoint to some of the ideas that I want to, to uh, discuss today. So let me share my screen with you. Um, so uh, the title of the talk is The Ever Falling Darkness of History, which is uh, um, a line from uh, Tagore's poem, Shah Jahan, uh, as translated by, uh, by William uh, Radice. Uh, in, in, in the selected poems. Um, and uh, I should just say ahead of, 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 of beginning that uh, all the paintings that have been used to illustrate uh, my talk today are by Rabindranath himself, by Abhinindranath, uh, by another member of the family, Gaganindranath, who was also a painter. Um, and some of them are by Nicholas Rorick, uh, who was a sort of contemporary uh, of the Tagores, uh, a Russian mystic, uh, and um, he had a very striking way of uh, painting, and he especially painted uh, the Himalayas, um, the Himalaya mountains, and, and those are actually quite significant for, for what I'm about to say, so that's why I um, sort of, sort of uh, used some of his uh, work to um, um, illustrate. Uh, the ideas that uh, that we'll be talking about. So, um, um, you know, in the vast oeuvre of, of Rabindranath Tagore, I mean, he has something like 200 books and 3000 paintings. Um, and, you know, uh, he produced poetry, fiction, um, essays, speeches, 
uh, novels, uh, paintings, music, lyric. Uh, I mean, he was a polymath and he produced so much in so many genres and so many media. Um, but what I have uh, done is um, isolated uh, a set of themes and a set of tropes and a set of symbols uh, that he returned to again and again throughout his um, uh, career spanning, you know, um, uh, more than 50 years uh, of, 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 of creative output. Um, and what I'm engaged with specifically here is these, um, a set of poems uh, and a set of essays um, that uh, go back to uh, the classical Sanskrit poet um, uh, Kalidasa from the fifth century and specifically to one of his uh, uh, most famous poems, a long poem called the Meghaduta uh, or the Cloud Messenger. Um, and what Tagore does is that he returns to this poem again and again and rewrites it or takes different parts and aspects of the poem and reflects uh, on them in his poetry as well as in some of his prose writings. Um, and I was sort of interested in why he does this and in what we can understand about his, um, his thinking about um, time, um, the nature of being in time, the human condition vis-a-vis our mortality, our historicity, um, the, the nature of attachment to land, home, um, and country, um, uh, our sense of belonging, uh, our, our, our uh, affect, uh, bhava associated with separation and with longing, um, and uh, a range of sort of related themes which coalesce around the central emotion of this poem of Kalidasa's, uh, which is viraha. Now viraha or viraha in uh, Bangla um, uh, is, 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 is perhaps uh, one of the principal categories uh, across aesthetic traditions, um, uh, especially spring, uh, from, from the Sanskrit. Uh, in, in, in India's literary uh, cultures and, and history. And I would say continues to, to be quite significant, you know, right into, into Bollywood, um, uh, even in our own time. Um, Viraha is literally the longing uh, uh, and the anguish produced on account of the separation of the self uh, from the beloved. Uh, it could be uh, a beloved person, uh, a, a beloved object, a beloved place. Uh, it could be, uh, you know, home. Um, it could be a time that is uh, past uh, and to which there is no returning, right? Um, and the bhava of viraha is something which I feel um, um, and I, I show uh, uh, through, a, through close reading of, of, of a whole range of texts, um, really informs the way in which um, Tagore arrives at his critique of nationalism and at his critique of the nation state uh, as a political form. Um, and you cannot really understand the radical nature of, of Rabindranath's um, uh, vision, political vision, and his political imagination without understanding the centrality of Viraha. Um, this idea of separation, of, of the longing born out of separation, um, and uh, uh, of, 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 of uh, possibly um, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the or, or rather the, the uncertainty of the future where you, it, it's possible that there may never be a reunion uh, with that longed for beloved object, which is now, which you are now separated from, right? So it's, 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 it's not a teleological um, uh, idea. It's not an idea uh, with a kind of, uh, you know, uh, purposeful moving into a futurity where, where this separation, this gap will be closed 
uh, where you will achieve union or consummation. Um, it, is, it is simply an acknowledgement uh, of that aporia or that distance uh, which always obtains uh, between um, uh, the self and, and, and that which the self loves and longs for and cannot have. So very quickly, I mean, you're probably all familiar with this, but the story of, of, the, of Kalidasa's Meghaduta um, is that um, the central character who is uh, a yaksha, um, he is a, a sort of semi-divine being um, and he's, he's nameless, um, sort of an everyman. Uh, he has been banished from his home, which is in the city of Alaka, which is somewhere in the mountains. And he is far from his beloved. He's been banished because of, of, of some sort of transgression um, that, uh, you know, he's, he's sort of punished and in exile uh, indefinitely. And he's missing home and he's missing his beloved who is back in Alaka. And uh, one day he sees uh, a cloud passing by and he starts talking to the cloud because he's sort of crazed with, with grief uh, and with, with, with this longing for home. And he says to the cloud that, you know, you're going north and you're going to go and visit my home. So will you take a message for me to my beloved? And um, the whole poem consists of this man talking to this cloud, not this man, this yaksha talking to this cloud. Um, and both describing his home and his city and his beloved, uh, but also describing how he feels and also, um, in great detail elaborating the root, uh, the kind of geophysical uh, root that the cloud will take as, as it kind of traverses this topography uh, where, from the point where, uh, where the yaksha is exiled in a place called Ramagiri, uh, uh, all the way to north and up into the mountains uh, to Alaka. Um, so everything that the cloud will encounter on the way um, you know, the people and the places and the rivers and the mountains and the trees and the, and the animals and the women and the cities, everything that, that, you know, the cloud will pass over is described in sort of loving detail. Um, and, and finally, the cloud will uh, supposedly arrive at Alka and, 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 and uh, convey um, the man's, uh, uh, the Yaksha's message. Um, so this is the sort of conceit of, of the poem. It, it, it involves a journey, but it's, it's an imaginary journey. Um, and um, um, this, is, this is a line from, uh, from Kalidasa uh, in translation. Um, a cloud is a conglomeration of vapor, light, water, and wind, and messages must be conveyed by living beings with keen faculties. But ignoring in his enthusiasm this incongruity, the yaksha made a request to the cloud those consumed by love petition the sentient and the dumb indiscriminately. So it's there's a certain um, sort of playfulness, uh, sweetness, and a hopelessness to this yaksha and to the state of mind that he's in. Now, this is a painting um, by Abhinindranath Tagore. It's called uh, Cloud Messenger. It's from 1904. Um, and it will speak to in many ways, um, uh, all of the poems that that uh, uh, Rabindranath writes again and again, looking at this very figure of, of, of the Yaksha. So one of the poems is titled Yaksha, um, another is titled uh, Meghdut. Uh, um, uh, there is also an essay called the Meghduta. Um, and um, uh, there's another poem called Meghdut as well. Uh, and another poem called Dream or Swapna, in which the, um, you know, the protagonist meets his beloved. Um, there is an actual meeting, but then it's a failed meeting. And I'll, 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 I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so these are just, uh, again, another sort of fragment from Kalidasa, um, uh, which says that, uh, you know, at the side of a cloud, even the, even the mind of, you know, of a happy man can sort of take a turn, right? The man becomes sort of anyatha uh, his, his, uh, and, and um, in the absence uh, you know, of, 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 of your loved one, a uh, man who's sort of longing for an embrace, um, how much more is his, you know, his head in a spin, uh, literally, how much more so a man at 
far remove longing for an embrace kim puna dura samsthe right so this 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 phrase dura samstha right situated at a distance um this is actually key to the to the metaphysics that i'm 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 trying to isolate that i feel um you know will help us to to understand uh, tagore's uh, uh political vision the aporia at the heart of his political vision that uh, actually leads to the critique of nationalism right um so um you know there are beautiful descriptions in kalidas uh, of 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 the landscape um and uh, particularly of 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 the mountains the majestic mountains where alika is located um and this is one of the most celebrated images uh um where he says that uh, you know uh, he says to the cloud yaksha says to the cloud that you know you you see mount kailash which is stretching across the sky and it has these brilliant white peaks and the mountain looks like you know the wild laughter of 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 triambak uh, of the three eyed god which is piled up rashi bhuta uh um uh, uh night after night right so so there's a kind of absolutely vivid description of the white peaks uh, of the himalaya um as though it were the laughter of the god uh writ large um you know there's this kind of joyousness to this um uh, to, to to the poetic expression that this is another um, sort of famous uh, set of verses where uh again yaksha is addressing the cloud and he says you know you will see alika in the lap of the mountain um uh, you know like like a woman sitting in the lap of her lover uh, the ganga the river is her shawl it's slipping off and and how could you not recognize her she wears her soaring palaces um uh you know uh in 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 her soaring pal- palaces she wears this sort of a mass of clouds uh, raining water just as a lady in love wears her hair entwined with strings of pearls these are all now uh, rorick's paintings and actually rorick um was interested in buddhism and in tibetan buddhism um so um you know uh, a lot of his uh, images are um are reflective of that uh, of his travels and his interest in in mahayana buddhism um um but um you know a lot of them are are these kind of dream like uh, very uh, vivid uh, uh, images just of the of the mountains themselves um so this is uh, now a painting actually by uh, rabindranath uh, rabindranath painted as i said he he made over 3000 works but really in the very end of his life probably in the last decade just in the 1930s he died in 1941 um and i would argue that uh just as his this particular cycle of poems uh, dealing with viraha um you know just as 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 they dwell on questions of of separation of absence of longing of exile uh, of the impossibility of union reunion or consummation um uh, and and acknowledging um that the very nature of human existence uh implies uh, the perpetual closure of the, of the possibility of returning to the past right um just as you know you can you can read that through the cycle of poems through his paintings and the particular style of his paintings um which is abstract uh which is not figurative which is not uh, sort of um uh, descriptive uh you know uh, uh which 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 does not have any kind of straightforward mimetic reference to or depiction of either landscape or or portraiture or uh you know uh, uh human activity or or the natural world um you know through the through uh, a, a careful reading of the aesthetics of his of his visual uh, art also um we continually return to this idea of um the elusive self um um uh, the longing 
um, um, of, of the self for a, an absent beloved. Um, and uh, repeatedly these questions of loss, uh, of, of the nature of time, the nature of memory, uh, and um, um, the sort of very, very, um, um, uh, almost, uh, you know, sort of uh, impossible to express uh, nature of, 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 of uh, what passes uh, between people, uh, especially when, uh, uh, when, when there's sort of unrequited love um, or, or, or love is interrupted in some sense or, or uh, you know, fails to find expression as it were. Um, so what, what, um, what Tagore does in his poems um, is that he um, he uh, he speaks about the yaksha and as the yaksha, putting himself in the yaksha's position. But he also identifies as a poet with Kalidasa, right? Uh, who's who's the poet of the Meghadoop. And sometimes he also takes the position of the cloud, who's the addressee of, of, of the yaksha's lament and the yaksha's sort of um, uh, message, uh, which is being sent back home. So, so in a sense, uh, he has this very kind of complex positioning, which keeps changing in the course of the poems. He is a modern poet and he's talking to his sort of uh, pre-modern ancestor uh, in, in a poetic tradition. Um, he is also, uh, a lover separated from his beloved. Um, he is also uh, a sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, a narrator in a sense, um, uh, who is able to uh, view uh, the entire landscape, as it were, of of, of this poem um, uh, from from the point of view of the cloud, uh, uh, which you know in any case provides uh, the kind of perspective on the land uh, that is being uh, crossed uh, in this cloud's uh, future imaginary journey. Um, now, uh, I, I actually, you know, be begin in, in the book by talking about, you know, uh, the strong connection between um, modern poetry and modern nationalism. And we can see this in a range of poets uh, from Goethe, who uh, Tagore is, is, is compared to, um, to uh, uh, Iqbal, uh, to Nazrul Islam, to Yeats, to Whitman, um, you know, uh, in a range of different political contexts and, uh, you know, national histories, you see this figure of the poet, um, you know, who gives voice to this, uh, to this nation and the love for the nation. And Rabindranath Tagore, is and isn't in that number. I mean, he shares many things with all of these poets, with, with, with Iqbal, with Yeats, with Whitman and so on, um, um, and with Bong Kim, right? Uh, in being able to evoke uh, the sense of a place, especially if that place happens to be Bengal, um, you know, strong relationship to the language of that place. Um, I mean, Tagore is one of the sort of fathers of modern Bengali. Um, he's also, of course, uh, you know, uh, the person whose, whose lyrics were chosen uh, for the national anthems of both India and Bangladesh. Um, and yet, uh, you know, my, my insistence uh, is that it's, it's, it's not only ironic uh, in, in being, and it's not only false, it's actually tragic to think of him as our national poet. Um, because he's so fundamentally opposed to the idea of the nation um, uh, and to nationalism as such. Um, so he's sitting in Bengal and he's sitting in his room and he's thinking about poets before him like Jayadev, the author of the Gita Govinda and Kalidasa, who's the sort of first one and then Vidyapati and Chandidas and uh, Jibanananda. And he's just thinking of all these uh, you know, other poets, uh, all of whom are moved in a particular kind of poetic aesthetic literary tradition by the sight of the clouds of the rainy season, of, of the season of Ashar, right? And, and what happens to the poetic mind uh, upon seeing the clouds, 
you know, enter into, into the horizon and fill up the sky? You know, what emotions um, uh, in, in this poetic tradition, which is, you know, highly uh, kind of formalized, conventional, conventionalized, you know, and, and, and which has a kind of set of a repertoire of tropes uh, that, that echo and reinforce one another through a long literary history, starting with the Sanskrit and leading into modern Bengali. So, so Ravindranath is very aware of that. And he says, you know, that this is what, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not just sitting here and looking at the clouds. You know, I am a poet, which means that I have these poetic ancestors um, and that I'm thinking about other poetry. Um, um, and this again is, is one of his paintings. Um, and he says, uh, you know, now he's addressing Kalidasa and he says, Supreme Poet, you know, that first day, Asharda Sio Prathama Divase, it can also be Prashama Divase, there's some, um, there's some debate about this in the, in the Sanskrit. Uh, so it's either the first day or the last day of Ashar. Uh, God knows when, you know, 1500 years ago, you wrote your Megaduta, right? Um, and you marked forever um, that, that transition in the natural world, in the cycle of seasons, which returns every year uh, and brings afresh uh, its, its, its longings and its, its, uh, its beauty and, and evokes those emotions in generation after generation of, of, uh, of, of poets. Um, every year has given new life to your poem. He's, he's addressing Kalidasa, right? And, and then he thinks, he thinks about himself uh, and where he is. And he says, you know, it's a dark day and it's this incessant rain and my mind leaves the room and it travels like the Yaksha's cloud. It flies far and wide. Um, but where am I? He always has a sense of, of his own location, just as the Yaksha is stuck in Ramagiri, he's stuck in East India in Bengal. And he's, he's sitting in a room and he's reading the Megaduta. And this, this experience, this literary experience is producing, um, you know, a whole range of reflections. Um, this again is, is one of Tagore's own paintings. Um, um, and he, he is suddenly able to see the the way in which um, great poetry will generalize, universalize some aspect of human experience, right? And, and what is that experience? That experience is one of separation, of pining, of viraha, right? Um, so all of that is sort of reinforced by, by this, this, this downpour of rain, by a recall of a poetic tradition which associates that rain with, with particular emotions. Um, and then, you know, triggers in fact, those very emotions in the psyche, um, uh, you know, of the poet, of the reader, of the listener, or of the witness, uh, whoever that be, uh, who's watching uh, these clouds sitting, sitting in his room. Um, your stanzas, he says to Kalidasa, they themselves are like clouds. Uh, you know, they're heaping this, this sort of pain, um, uh, the misery of all separated lovers throughout the world into thunderous music. Um, uh, again, a painting by, uh, by uh, Rabindranath uh, himself. Um, um, and, and then through the poem, he can hear uh, through this kind of empathic poetic transference, he can hear all the grief of all the lovers who were ever separated from their beloveds. Uh, he can hear their voices. They sound in my ear like waves on, on the seashore, um, right? Um, who but you, poet, could take me there, right? Um, the extraordinary power of the poet to evoke um, a time, a mood, a, 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 a place, uh, an emotion, uh, and an entire interior landscape, as it were. Um, that is what uh, that is what uh, you know we are seeing here, um, and it triggers in him. Your spell has released tight bonds of pain in this heart of mine. I too have entered that heaven of yearning, 
beyond all the rivers and mountains of this world. Um, and of course, this brings him to the question, you know, why this yearning, right? Because you are situated at a distance, dura samstha, right? Why does love not find its true path? You know, why can't, why can't, um, why can't the lover himself walk that distance and, and, and go and meet the beloved uh, who has been uh, separated from, uh, from him? Um, uh, and as he's thinking these thoughts, you know, the vision passes and, and, and it's just rain falling. That's all that's happening. Um, um, you know, I just uh, continue to sort of combine uh, the paintings with, with, the, with the lines uh, from, these, from these three or four different poems. Um, and then, you know, the night comes on and, 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 and the solitude and I am sleepless half the night asking who has cursed us thus, why this gulf? Why do we aim so high only to weep when thwarted, right? Um, and finally, he says uh, in, the, in the Yaksha poem that, that time essentially is defined by um, uh, separation. That is the that is the unit of time uh, is, is 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 separation. It tries door after future door. William Radice says this is a very very hard poem from the Bangla to actually translate into any kind of uh, English that is comprehensible. Life after future life and an endless attempt to close its distance from from uh, perfection, um, uh, purnata, right. And uh, the, the, the distance, the separation is, is bhed, right? How do you close that separation from perfection? There's a kind of asymptotic process where you're always approaching perfection but never able to attain it. The world is its poem, a rolling sonorous poem in which a rem remote presage of joy annotates vast sorrow. Um, it's, it's a very idiosyncratic translation. Uh, I mean, you should go back to the, to the Bangla. Now, the poet also thinks about this silent, distant, um, wretched uh, beloved who has been sort of abandoned in her city, right? We, we don't see anything of her point of view. We don't know what she's feeling. We can't hear from, we don't hear from her. The poet has given her pining no language, her love no pilgrimage, right? Even if it's by proxy, by cloud. For her, the unspeaking Yaksha city is a meaningless prison of riches. So it's this grand, beautiful city, but it's a prison because it keeps her from her love. Permanent flowers, eternal moonlight, mortal existence knows no grief as great as this, never to wake from dreams. Um, so here are the ideas that, that are sort of central to the way in which um, uh, Tagore is treating uh, time. In these in these poems, um, there is the idea of aporia, which 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 uh, literally means without passage, uh, the loss of a way um, to get from here to there, uh, right? Um, the idea of aphasia, which is the loss of language, uh, uh, lacking in words to express uh, what is what is in the mind or in the heart, amnesia, the loss of memory, right? without uh, being without recollection. So without passage, without words, without recollection, um, this is the way in which, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 as humans, we are stranded in time. Um, uh, and, and, and the time of history, which he discusses in this essay, uh, which uh, Ranajit Guha also uh, talks about, um, uh, it's, uh, the, the, the time of the past, is, is something that we may never return to, that we may not even be able to remember properly, that, that we cannot reconstruct or assume we'll, we'll, we will find again in the future, right? And, and all of this sort of lack and loss and absence um, is at the core of the struggle for expression um, that the poet articulates. Um, he articulates the struggle. He can't really articulate what it is that he's 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 struggling to convey. Um, so, in another poem, which is uh, called "Dream," um, 
you know, we are now in the city of Ujjain, uh, uh, which was important for, for Kalidas. He may have been, he may have lived there um, himself, uh, historically the poet. Um, and so in the city of Ujjain by the river Shipra, you know, I went to meet my lover. Uh, this is what the, the poem says. And, and, and she asked, you know, she asked me with her eyes, she didn't say the words, but she asked me with her eyes, hope you're well. Uh, I looked at her face and I found no words. That language was lost to us, right? We tried so hard to recall each other's name, aphasia, amnesia, aporia, right? We couldn't remember. We couldn't remember one another's name. We thought so hard as we gazed at each other and the tears streamed from our unflickering eyes. So even at the moment of meeting, um, that final gap cannot be closed. There is no connection. There is no passage. Um, this gulf that separates uh, the lovers, um, um, which is which is in the nature of, of our of our temporal experience uh, itself. Keen with yearning, they mingled quietly, quietly, her breath and my breath, but, but no words were exchanged. We couldn't even remember each other's names. Night's darkness swallowed the city of Ujjain. Everything disappears from, from sight. In the Shiva temple on River Shipra's bank, the evening service came to an abrupt end, a lapse into silence. So look at these images again and again. Night's darkness swallowed the city of Ujjain. The vision goes, the evening service comes to an abrupt end. I'm picking these from the different poems. Um, and it's the same kind of uh, dark, silent uh, absence uh, that, that, that uh, the poet is evoking again and again. Um, so at the end of the Yaksha poem, he finally says that, uh, you know, all the yaksha can do is, 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 is sort of uh, express his viraha itself, right? Um, he has granted that the yaksha may pound her door with yearning. He longs to sweep his beloved away on the surging stream of his heart, away from the motionless mounts of heaven, the prison of riches where the beloved is, is stuck into the light of this many colored shadow dabbled mortal world. Right. Um, this is this is the sort of uh, the eff the effervescence of of, of poetic creativity. Um, now I want to move from this uh, set of poems, and I'm, I'm you know uh, approaching uh, the end of my time. I think um, to another set of poems uh, in which uh, Tagore again returns to these themes. Of, of time, of history, of separation, of memory, um, and eventually of nation. Um, and here he, 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 these poems are, uh, you know, uh, uh, centered on, on um, the image of the Taj Mahal, right? Monumentality and history. Um, and um, uh, the, the, the most famous poem of this, of this, uh, uh, of this uh, lot, is uh, is um, uh, a poem called Shah Jahan, um, and um, what is happening at the same time as 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 Rabindranath is writing Shah Jahan is that Abhinandranath, his nephew, uh, who is a painter, uh, you know, is doing a series of paintings about the great Mughals, and he paints Shah Jahan again and again. Uh, in, in different stages of his, of his life, uh, his youth and his old age, and finally on his deathbed, where he is supervising the building of the Taj Mahal uh, as, a, as, a, as a tomb for his, for his beloved who has, who has died. And then Shah Jahan himself as, at his deathbed, um, you know, taking a last look uh, uh, at, at, at this, this edifice of beauty that he has built, that, that that may uh, that will outlast both him and and his beloved, um, uh, you know, for whom uh, it was made. Um, but what is the nature of 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 of, of this beauty uh, relative to um, the the constraints of human existence and the human condition, right? Is it is it immortal versus the mortality of the human creator, 
of 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 this uh, you know this artifact um and 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 what does that really tell us about uh, the nature of love i mean does it does it last forever or 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 does it die with with the lovers themselves um and i i i actually look at um you know these 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 ideas um uh that that uh, uh, you know are expressed in two very different ways by Rabindranath and by Abhinandranath, um, and I, I I kind of you know understand them in terms of these these opposed categories of the poetic and the political, right? Of poesis and of praxis, uh, poesis being the kind of production into presence uh, of of form. Right, making seen that which is unseen. Um, that is is what poesis is, um, and and you know I rely here on on uh, some of Agamben's writings um, versus practice or praxis, which is which is about uh, realizing, materializing, you know, you know creating a, a kind of positive correlative. Uh, for 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 whatever uh, ideas uh, you know are there uh, unseen in the mind, um, and and I want to suggest that you know we can understand Rabindranath's uh, sort of uh, metaphysics through through the category of poesis, but Abhinandranath's through the idea of praxis. Um, why? Because Abhinandranath, uh, you know, is is engaged uh, in 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 exploring um, the history of. Uh, an art uh, or a series of art forms that can be properly characterized as uh, uh, as Indian, right? How do you create a, a history of Indian art, right? Which is distinct from um, uh, Western art or African art or any other kind of art. Um, that is part of the nationalist project. Um, and uh, in this, in the course of this, you know, he's painting the great Mughals, but he's also looking at Mughal miniatures and, and Rajput miniatures and Pahari miniatures. He's looking at Buddhist art. He's looking at, you know, um, uh, Islamic art and architecture. Uh, he's looking at historical monuments. He's looking at archeological uh, ruins, you know, everything from, from the caves of Ajanta uh, together with, you know, uh, theorists of art like, um, uh, like Kumara Swami um, uh, and others in the in in Shanti Niketan, uh, you know, who are sort of the authors of this Bengal Renaissance, in a sense, uh, like Jamini Roy and Nandalal Bose and and all these disciples and acolytes and 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 you know companions of Rabindranath and Abhinandranath, you know, they are trying to imagine what a history of Indian art would look like, what would be included in it. You know what styles, what genres, what forms, what figures, what monuments. Uh, you know, um, and 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 how would these uh, help to imagine of the future Indian nation, right? Which would say one day have a national museum, which it will no longer have, in fact, um, uh, from where we are in, at present. Um, so um, so here is uh, one of Rabindranath's most famous sort of images of a woman. Um, and, and here is Abhinandranath's Bharat Mata, um, you know, who, who is quite central to the Swadeshi movement in, in, in uh, the early part of the 20th century in, in, in uh, you know, in the first partition in a sense of, of, of Bengal around 1905, you know, uh, which is a sort of materialization, a visual representation of the idea of Bengal and the idea of uh, India, right? As, as this kind of feminine figure of, of, of nourishment, of, of caring, of, of, of plenitude, of, you know, uh, pedagogy, of protection, uh, kind of, uh, you know, semi-divine goddess-like maternal figure, um, you know, who will, who will feed and, 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 and educate and protect and, and uh, provide spiritual succor, uh, you know, to the people. This is Bharat Mata. Um, Again, hugely distorted in our time, um, uh, but but you know originally sort of this very delicate figure. But here I'm trying to sort of literally illustrate, you know, the difference between poesis and praxis, right? Rabindranath is not trying to tell you anything about the history of Indian art, 
uh, you know, or, 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 or what is Indian about Indian art or what are those sources of the Indian self, right? His, his paintings are, uh, are personal, they are intimate, they're also abstract um, and, and uh, they refer to, you know, uh, uh, his own memories, uh, you know, his own loves, his own losses. Um, you know, his, 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 his uh, experience um, to which we have only these, uh, these strange windows, um, but, but that cannot be conveyed uh, in any kind of uh, straightforward manner. Um, so, um, so, yeah, here is, is, is Bharat Mata. Um, but, so, so again, you know, look at all these three paintings by Abhinandranath and, you know, they are figurative. Um, you know, they are, they're imaginative, but they're also figurative. And they also have reference to styles of Indian painting that are historically attested, right? Um, so here you, you have uh, Bharat Mata, then, then the Yaksha, and then the passing of Shah Jahan. The Shah Jahan is at his deathbed. His daughter Jahan Begum is, is at his feet, uh, you know, and he's taking a last look across the river Yamuna and Agra. Uh, at at this this monument that he has built, um, and um, you know Tagore, uh, Tagore's sort of most direct statement against nationalism is 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 available in the set of lectures that he delivered, you know, at the height of of, of World War One, uh, in Japan, in the United States, you know, then the kind of two rising powers um, uh, of the world of the modern world, um, where he talks about nationalism in these countries, in these cultures. Um, and, and then he talks about, uh, you know, nationalism in India and why he, uh, why he opposes it. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, and his poem, Shah Jahan, um, sort of addresses some of these questions in a, in a very complicated way, right? Um, uh, by looking at the sort of quiddity of the art object, um, in this case, the Taj Mahal, um, which, which in a sense will outlast its maker uh, and the love that it's supposed to signify, uh, you know, uh, between uh, Shah Jahan and, and Mumtaz Mahal. So how wonderful the deathless clothing with which you invested formless death, poet emperor, right? So Shah Jahan is, 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 is a little bit like Kalidasa, right? He's, he's a figure that, um, that, that, Tagore is, in a sense, identifying with uh, as a kind of artist. Um, this is your heart's picture, your new Meghaduta, right? So K Kalidasa is becoming Shah Jahan and, and then, you know, being voiced through Tagore himself. This beauty is your messenger skirting time centuries to carry the wordless message. I have not forgotten you, my love. I have not forgotten you. Um, but, you know, we cannot monumentalize, freeze, and render permanent the human experience. Oh, human heart, you have no time to look back at anyone again, no time. You are driven by life's quick spate on and on from landing to landing, loading cargo here, unloading there. That traveler is no longer here, no longer here. I remain here. Now the Taj is speaking. I remain here, weighted with memory. He is free of burdens. Shah Jahan is gone. He is no longer here. Tombs remain forever. This is another one of Abhinindranath's paintings where a younger Shah Jahan is just beginning to build the Taj Mahal. Um, um, who can hold life? Um, you know, life itself can't be. Uh, fixed um, in, in the way that um, the Taj Mahal uh, has been poet emperor, this is your heart's picture. Um, so again, now this, 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 this idea of the heart's picture, right? Of what can be visualized, of what can be remembered, of what can be seen, of what can be recollected in the mind's eye, right? These are recurring tropes throughout uh, Tagore's poems, at least these ones that I've, I've read. Um, there is Ujjaini, the city of Ujjain, gazing at her own great shadow in the Shipra River. Again, the idea of reflection, of representation, of, of, of visualization. 
suddenly they're opened up as if drawn on a picture, Ashar's tear soaked beautiful world, right? The world of Kalidasa's, um, the journey of the, of the cloud, right? Um, and then this idea of, um, of, 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 of sounding, of visualizing, of remembering, but of moving on, right? A huge separation dwells at the heart of onward time um, that tries uh, door after future door, life after future door, life in an endless attempt to close its distance from perfection. The asymptotic, right? Which is the opposite of the historical, the teleological, the Hegelian, the nationalist, right? Um, which is marching towards uh, you know, modernity, the nation, independence, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, that's, that's not the modality in which uh, Rabindranath operates. Um, so um, I'm, 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 I'm sort of, you know, unable to, to dwell at length or in detail on any of the, of the particular poems that, that we talked about. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm happy to answer questions and uh, return to, uh, you know, uh, return to anything that you want to talk about um, and, and to talk more about how actually um, I, I, I try to make a robust connection between um, the aesthetics of these particular works and, um, you know, um, uh, uh, Rabindranath's uh, sort of, um, uh, opposition to resistance to the idea of, of nationalism and the nation um, and, and the temporality, the historicity, et cetera, and the violence that, uh, that is necessitated by, um, by this um, uh, quest for, for, for nationality, um, uh, for the nation itself. Um, uh, so here I'll stop. I think I've spoken now for 50 minutes. So um, Rahul, if you could, uh, if you could, you know, take over. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ananya. It was a wonderful talk. And um, I, I'm sure I speak for everyone uh, with uh, gratitude for the very subtle and nuanced discussion of, of Tagore's poetry. Um, I, I want to, um, yeah, start a conversation about some of the things that, that came up in the talk that I think very intriguing. We have some questions from the participants. I'd like to Remind the participants uh, that if you have questions, please uh, type them into the Q&A box um, so that we can uh, have a look at those questions. Um, I, I want to just start by saying you ask one of the most, one of my favorite types of historical questions, namely the, the kind of aspects of the past that in some ways are taken for granted, that are in, in some ways hiding in plain sight. Um, and the, this, uh, I'm coming back to something I said right in the beginning, uh, and one of your central ideas is that what is the swa in Swaraj? And what is, what is this self? And, uh, and uh, at the very beginning of the talk, you, you talked about the, the, the yaksha's exile and why Tagore is so interested in this problem of exile as a, a, a one that he's thinking about in his moment, a kind of a problem of, of modernity. And I wanted to ask you to kind of to talk a little bit about the way exile, exclusion, and alienation is kind of implicated in what Tagore sees as this emerging or has now emerged nation thinking. Um, and I was really struck uh, by something you said that it, it's tragic to think of, of Tagore as, as a national poet or our national poet. And, um, and so what is this, this um, what, what kind of viraha, what kind of uh, uh, longing is produced by the idea of the nation or nation thinking? Um, you know, I, um, you can't see my screen anymore, I guess. No, we, um, yeah, uh, you know, I, obviously I, I you know, I looked at uh, a number of of scholars who have written about Tagore and nationalism, Tagore and his poetry and so on, Tagore and his art. Um, and, you know, uh, what, a couple of key ideas, you know, 
one is uh, from Shadipta Kaviraj, you know, who writes about Bankin, right? And uh, there he, he looks at this idea of alienation uh, and this idea of exile and, and the idea uh, of, of, of the sort of modernism of, 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 of Bankin, you know, Bankin's, in Bankin's aesthetics. Um, and, you know, he looks at the figure of Krishna uh, in 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 Bankim versus in somebody like uh, Jayadev in the in the Gita Govinda, right? Which is which is somewhat similar to what I'm trying to do with with Rabindranath and with Kalidas, right? So I'm, I'm taking a kind of modern uh, figure and I'm taking a, 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 a you know a, a very 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 sort of pre-modern classical figure and I'm 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 trying to to work through. Um, uh, their their uh, their their imagery and their their conversation with one another, right? Uh, but since it's the conscious exploration of tradition that defines the moderns, howsoever different Bankim and, and Rabindranath are from each other, um, and um, this idea of of you know Shridipto Kaviraj at least in 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 that in, in unhappy consciousness, uh, you know he he. Um, uh, he's 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 really uh, he's he's exploring this uh, this 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 difference between you know a warlike Krishna uh, the, the classicized sort of Krishna uh, on the one hand and the lover uh, the 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 cowherd the the sort of young boy uh, you know in Vrindavan uh, that you see in 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 uh, in, in Jayadev, in, in the Gita Govinda, right? So he's looking at Krishna of the Mahabharata and then Krishna of, 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 of the, of the of, of, you know, of Braj. And, um, and really trying to explore um, where differences between ideas of selfhood and sovereignty enter into uh, and, and, and define the sort of uh, aesthetic trajectories of 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 uh, Bankim versus, you know, uh, of, of of some ancestor like like um, uh, like J uh, like Jayadev, right? Um, and uh, the other idea that I you know wanted to wanted to explore was uh, you know uh, uh, Sheldon Pollock talks about. I mean, his whole his whole work in a sense is about um, the 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 imbrication of Kavya. Of, of literary uh, poetic language uh, with the idea of sovereign power in, in the pre-modern world, in the world of the Sanskrit cosmopolis, right? What is uh, literary language of and highly generically kind of codified, uh, formally uh, codified, uh, reproduced across vernaculars? What is Kavya uh, as a form of language actually uh, connoting uh, and doing in the world um, where it is uh, correlated with uh, certain forms of sovereign power, right? How does it connote prestige? How does it, how does it connote uh, erudition? How does it connote, um, you know, cosmopolitanism? How does it travel? How does it circulate? How does it invite patronage and so on? So the literary form becomes a carrier of certain kind of a political project, right? Now, what we want to explore in a sense, uh, you know, although, I mean, I, I didn't explicitly do this in the book, but I wanted to do this, um, is look at how uh, somebody like Tagore is, is breaking, right? That, um, that uh, sort of, uh, 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 the, that understanding of the of the function of literature, right, where it has to be allied to uh, uh, to a, a a project that is essentially a political project, a project that has to do with power, right. Um, so so Tagore never produces an epic, you know, and 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 uh, Amit Chaudhary points this out, right, and he's he's interested in in the Ramayana and the Mahabharata and how they you know, how they evoke again, a certain idea of, of, of space time and of character and of morality and of the human condition. But he is not an epic poet of the Indian nation, right? And he's not, he doesn't think about sovereignty, territoriality, speciality, history, right? 
in the form of itihas, right? And and in fact, his essay is called, uh, you know, the 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 historicality of literature, right? Or the his the historicality in literature, right? Um, and that's what um, you know Ranjit Guha discusses at, at at such length that, you know. Um, and, and this is why, uh, and Ramchandra Guha also talks about this, you know, that why, why is Tagore, why, why can you say he is and he isn't like Goethe, right? Um, because the, the poetry is not in service of nation building, right? It is not about, you know, collective identity. You know, he, he, he has other categories. I mean, he talks about Swaraj and he develops it as an idea, um, Sahitya, right? Uh, Samaj, very, very important uh, for Tagore. These are all a kind of family of concepts uh, together with Viraha. But Viraha is central and Viraha is not about, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the construction um, of, of a collective identity. It's precisely about the impossibility of any such construction given our perpetual state of alienation, separation, and loss, um, which is which is human existence and time, right? Um, so, I mean, it, it's not really. I mean, and uh, Kaviraj has has this discussion. And he has a very very early essay on uh, on the Meghaduta, you know, um, uh, which in which he has a straightforward sort of Marxist understanding of like alienation that the Yaksha is experiencing. You know, and he says this is like modern man. This is his condition. It's alienate. It's a condition of alienation, right? He's alienated from his home. He's alienated from from his 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 beloved. He's alienated from his city, from his country, from his from himself, right? From everything that he holds dear. Um, and and in this sense, he's you know the yaksha is a quintessential modern man. Um, uh, but you know, Buddha Dev Bose uh, understands that that. He isn't, right? There's there's that kind of hint of the possibility of the modern uh, when Tagore uh, comes around to the yaksha, but but in the end, he refuses that, right? He refuses that understanding of alienation, right? Um, because you know the unalienated life, the pre-capitalist life. Right, this ancient India, which nowadays you know is, is being glorified all the time, you know, it's, um, I mean, the whole, the whole power of it is is its unattainability and it, it's it's kind of eternal, our eternal separation from the past, right? Um, that is not where where we are headed. That is where we came from. You know, home is what you leave behind, right? Um, and there is no returning home. There is no returning home. So that should not be our project, right? Um, uh, but rather trying to tune into the, you know, empathically um, to the loss and the grief uh, that that all humans experience. You know, suffering being the human condition, right? And to the longing that 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 defines our humanity, right? Being able to enter into that, that is the work of the poet, right? The work of the poet is, is, is not to write some sort of charter, um, you know, some sort of epic, uh, some sort of, you know, poem about conquest and victory and, 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 and domination, um, uh, you know, in the sense that, that, uh, that uh, you know, a Bonkim might or, or even an Iqbal might eventually, um, you know, tying their poetic project very strongly with the, with the idea of nation building, you know. Um, yeah, thank you. You've made that very clear throughout the talk that, um, that Tagore in many places is resisting this temptation for that type of solution, that type of sort of functionality of literature yeah. and engages yeah. with a more complicated um, uh, ontology of, yeah. of the self. And, and that's, I yeah. think, what's so powerful and engaging about Tagore, and I, I'll just repeat what you said again, this sort of tragic uh, appropriation of, of Tagore. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll ask a qu another question that's linked to one of our first questions in the chat box, uh, or sorry, the Q&A box. I, um, 
as you, you spoke very beautifully about uh, and nuanced and thoughtfully about the uh, the poems uh, and some of some of the audience may also know your connection your your poetic family um, your famous poet father Hindi poet father Kailash Vajpayee uh, so your um, engagement with poetry um, throughout the talk uh, is clear and, and the 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 images were extremely helpful. So I, I wondered, and uh, one of our first questions here also asks the, um, my question is, can you, how do you view, or how do you put in con conversation the, the sort of lyrical aesthetics, the, the poetic aesthetics and the aesthetics of the painting? And then the question um, from our, our first question here is, um, could you shed light on the color vision? So again, the uh, and the aesthetic problems in Tagore's paintings. Um, so let me let me get that straight. How am I connecting? Uh, yes, if you could put in conversation these things, but also maybe just if you want to just talk about the paintings and and how they're also um, okay. in this. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I you know I I I didn't do that. At, in, in any detail or length, uh, at any length here, uh, but um, you know, you see in in um, Abhinindranath's paintings, you know, there in a sense you can use them as illustrations, literally, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a yaksha sitting there, <laughs> and he's talking to a cloud, and that's that's what he shows, right? Um, there's Shah Jahan looking at the Taj Mahal and, and supervising its building or bidding farewell to life itself and to the Taj Mahal, right? There is Bharat Mata. Now this is an abstract idea, but nevertheless visualized with very, uh, in a, in a, you know, with, with, with these very kind of concrete symbols, uh, as I said, of, of, of nurturing, of, of caregiving, of matern maternal, you know, uh, sort of care, uh, for 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 uh, you know the children the, the the people of the nation as it were you know the children of this mother um, and and all those kind of things I mean there's a kind of uh, uh, illustrative figurative literal form right that is given to certain historical events certain uh, narratives certain you know textual uh, you know characters stories you know, uh, things that really happened in the world, things that really exist in the world, right? They are being illustrated in this, in this kind of pretty clear way. Now in Tagore's paintings, you have doodles, you have these shadowy figures, you know, you have this woman again and again and again and again, where it's just the face and it's, it's like, you know, half dark and it's kind of partly veiled. Right, and you don't really know. It doesn't really resemble, in 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 any way, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a given individual. Or you have these two figures, or you have these three figures, and they're in some kind of sort of complicated dynamic. But but they're they're abstract, right? They are not representational. They are not figurative. They are not portraits, right? Um, they are alluding to uh, states of mind, states of consciousness elements of memory, elements of desire, right? Uh, the kind of unconscious, um, uh, the subconscious, they, they, are, they are bringing up, you know, the repressed in many cases. I mean, a lot of there's been, you know, in the, in the art writing, you can, you can, you can see that um, there are uh, attempts to connect uh, Tagore's shadowy woman with Kadambari, Right, who was his his sister-in-law? Uh, uh, you know, who who who, who committed suicide, uh, and then you know his own wife who died very early, and you know a variety of other sort of unrequited or lost or or you know unavailable romantic interests that he had or relationships that he had, you know, um, that that those could be suggested possibly, right? If you want to try to sort of make a correlation between what he's painting and, and what, uh, you know, what those paintings mean, right? But they are not intended to illustrate anything other than the poet's own memory, his imagination, and his uh, impressions, and his mood, right? Um, and so also with his 
with the so-called landscapes, right? Which are, which are really not landscapes. Again, they're like sort of uh, evocations of mood and moment, you know, and, and of light um, and of darkness, right? Very often they're, they're really paintings about darkness, not about light. So, you know, you can't really clearly make out what it is that he's, he's showing. Um, so I, I, I sort of want to set this style of painting which he's only undertaking very, at a very old age, by the way, right? Um, right up to his, literally up to his death. Um, with, uh, you know, I want to contrast that to what everybody else in Shantiniketan is doing, right? Uh, which is looking at, you know, the tribal communities that surround uh, Bolpur, right, and, and, and that part of Bengal where they are, or looking at, you know, Buddhist art, or looking at the miniature painting, or looking at, you know, the sort of Kumaraswami project, right, writing a history of Indian art by kind of reproducing um, or trying to, you know, approximate different schools uh, of, of, of Indian art, different styles, different regional kind of styles of, of, of art that are available um, from all different parts of India. Right. And then, you, you know, you soon you establish this connection between Shantiniketan and Baroda, you know, all the way across. Um, and you have artists coming from South India, you have artists, you know, coming, flocking from all parts of India to learn how to paint as Indian painters, right, who are not learning Victorian or Edwardian, um, you know, uh, aesthetic conventions, but who are trying to, you know, return to uh, what they imagine is is the their own history of 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 art, and it could be sort of uh, courtly arts, and it could be sort of tribal arts and indigenous arts, and so on. And that's a separate question. But all those explorations have this kind of programmatic intention, right? Where what is happening in Shantiniketan, what is happening in that Bengal Renaissance moment, is is contributing to the nation building project to the project of finding Swaraj, right? And of, 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 of providing a repertoire of images um, to, to the people in their quest for a new nation and a new, new national identity, right? Um, so, you know, you, there's a whole series of paintings that Abhinindra Nath and others make uh, on, of Kashmir, for example, and Dara Shiko, right? A whole series to do with Aurangzeb, right? where the whole, a whole series to do with, you know, Rama and Krishna and so on. Again, you know, the myths of the people, the memories of the people, the histories of the people are to be painted. You do not get any such historical data out of any of Rabindranath's paintings, right? I mean, they could mean, they, they mean what, 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 what is in his mind. And you know you can only read that as a complex text, like you read poetry, right? Through through allusion and through through metaphor and through you know evocation and through through kind of this this complex uh, you know uh, uh, set of categories uh, you know of, of of bhava and rasa and so on. You know you can't read you can't sort of just just look at these paintings and say oh you know this is a picture of 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 Vishwa Bharati, or this is you know this is his his brother-in-law, or this is his you know this is his child, or anything anything so straightforward. Thanks, thank you for saying that. And yeah, it was very helpful, especially also earlier when you said that he's not participating in creating an art history. Um, yeah, or, or, yeah, that is history. the key. Yeah. And that, yeah. that is, of course, always implicated in a nationalist project, right? To create an Indian art, how to imagine the idea of an Indian art, for example. Yeah. 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 Even though that Shanti Naketan is the center of doing that, he's he's resisting that or, or... Right. I mean he's created Shanti Naketan, right? In a sense, he's <laughs> made the space available. He's populated it with all these people. But he is disengaged from the main uh, sort of activity that is taking place there. Right. And he's on his own private journey. You know this this Ekla Chalu I, I I you know I talk about that poem um, that uh, you know there's there's a kind of lonely path that he's walking and he's walking away from uh, mm. from from the political 
um, uh, in, in, into you know a higher truth, right? Um, I mean, uh, the, 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 there's a kind of myth associated with, with praxis, but there's truth associated with poetry, right? And that's what he's after, right? Um, and possibly this accounts for him being close to Gandhi, um, but that's, that's a longer question to explore. Yeah, the, the, and the sort of productive nature of, of exile that he's exploring. Um, I, I think we have time for one last question, and this pushes the, the previous question in a different direction, maybe. And I'll just read from the middle of it. If we look at Tagore, his Tagore's political tracks, this is the very last question, um, or even his work at Shantinikapan, he seems to be laying down a practical design slash project, a very well thought out plan for building a quote unquote desh. Uh, it would be great to, to hear you reflect on this. So, I mean, if, we, if he's not uh, uh, constructing a nation, um, I think the question here is asking uh, what, what do his political tracks then imagine um, if, if you can speak to that? Yeah, you know, um, this is something that, uh, you know, I, I mean, Ashish Nandi says, you know, at least once a week, uh, that patriotism is not the same as nationalism, right? That love of the land, um, you know, this idea of desh um, and bidesh, um, this idea of home and, uh, you know, not home uh, or, 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 or separation from home. I mean, these are, these, you know, these are uh, so so a kind of uh, uh, identification, right, of of the self with a, lo a locus, right, um, is fundamental to to uh, human societies, right. This is something which which Ashish has discussed uh, in a number of his writings, um, um, but that is not the same as modern nationalist sentiment and attachment to your nation, right? Um, which is driven by um, a strong desire to identify, you know, a territorial, uh, uh, the, the limits of the nation, right? Who's included, who's excluded, who gets to be a citizen, who is always going to be, you know, um, uh, an intruder, an invader, an immigrant, a foreigner, right, the other, right? So, I mean, it's, it's not possible to have a kind of ontology of, of the self without some sense of that self being grounded in a place, right? And, and, and all of the traumas and the memories and the, and the, uh, the sort of, um, um, uh, you know, the self-recognition, the ability to even, even, even identify at all as, as, as a person, you know, that, that, that is strongly correlated to a location, um, and and at least for in, in in Nandi's sort of you know understanding, patriotism uh, has has some idea like that behind it, right? And in that sense, you could say that Rabindranath is a patriot, right? Because he loves Bengal, he loves the Bengali language, he you know loves the literature, he he knows it. He, 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 you know, nourishes it, he waters it with his, with his love, with his creativity, you know, he gives his whole life to, 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 to this, this, this set of ideas, right? Um, but what that has to do with what's happening in World War I and World War II and, and, and you know, uh, what, what, what Nehru is after, right? Um, uh, it's 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 two different kind of trajectories, right? So in my book, for example, I look at other art, uh, you know, art objects um, that become symbols, right, of identity, of national identity, right? So I look at you know the Ashoka pillar and the lion capital. I look at the national flag. I look at the national anthem. I look at the you know the chakra, the Ashoka chakra, which is at at the heart of the of the flag. Um, you know, I look at a variety of these uh, kind of images, um, which acquire a symbolic character, 
right? But what is it that they are, you know, the semiotics of those, those images, what are they trying to signify? They're signifying this India, right? With all of the meanings, you know, the, the Ashokan and the Buddhist and the, you know, the, 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 the Hindu and the Muslim and, and uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the entire kind of plethora of meanings that accrue and that are sought to be conveyed through the use and deployment and the choosing, the very careful selection of these symbols, um, you know, in the, in the constituent assembly or in, in the Congress deliberations or, uh, you know, through that process of, of partition and, and, and independence and constitution writing. So that's one sort of activity, right, which involves artistic symbols and so on. Um, uh, you know, where the, the, the nature of signification is very different from what Tagore is, is, is wanting to do. Um, you know, that he's, uh, you know, his symbols are not, they're not, they're not, uh, they're not meant to stand for, um, you know, um, um, you know, the India that is going to be, uh, you know, uh, produced as a, as a result of decolonization and so on, right? I mean, of course, he, you know, he will give you uh, he will give you that landscape which Kalidasa also gives you, right? Um, and it, it may be that that landscape has some names which suggest to you that, oh, this is the Himalaya and this is the Ganga and this is Ujjain and, you know, this is Shipra and this is, uh, you know, such and such place. Uh, and, and, and this corresponds to, you know, um, but this is not, you know, Mandir Vahi Banayenge. This is not that, you know, Ayodhya is, is is literally is literally that, right? Uh, it's a very very different conception of 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 um, you know of and I have a long discussion in my book about indexicality, right? How do you point to uh, a place, uh, right? How do you indicate something which is which is over there and and which which you know uh, you stand in a particular relation uh, with, you know? And how is that done exactly through the choice of words? and through the choice of images, right? Um, in the Abhinindranath chapter, if I can just take a second, I mean, I, I, I use the category of some vega, which is actually, you know, again, coming through Kumaraswamy, uh, but it's something like aesthetic shock, right? And there I'm saying it's the shock of the recognition of, of, of a kind of fugitive selfhood, right? That, oh, you know, the Taj Mahal, you know, this is India, right? Or, you know, the, the, the Sanchi Stupa or, 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 you know, the Ajanta paintings or, you know, whatever it is, right? That this is who we are, right? Um, that, that very modern form of identity making, right? Which is linked to place, which is linked to a certain use of these kind of symbols of the substance of selfhood. Right, that is completely something that Rabindranath is not. Um, you know, he doesn't follow that uh, that formula. Right, the self is precisely fugitive. It's like a sort of Upanishadic self. Right, it's very very small. It's 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 very very it's dreamlike. You know, it it's hidden. It's hidden. Right. Nihitam guhayam, it's hiding in, 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 in a cave, um, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's, it's an almost sort of psychological sort of a Freudian entity. Um, and, and of course, you know, Tagore is sort of an exact contemporary of Freud. Um, I don't, you know, and, and Sudhir Kakar explores this uh, more, which is something I, I hadn't looked at at the time that I wrote my book. Um, yeah. Thank you. That's could go on. <laughs> no, I would love to hear more. I think many in our audience would as well. Um, but the, the sort of ever falling darkness of time <laughs> right. eclipsing our, our, uh, our session. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Ananya Vajpay, and thank our audience members and, and um, apologize for, sorry. I thank you. I oh, mean, for Oh yeah, my honor, thank you. Uh, the, the questions, all of the questions that we couldn't get to, very sorry, but these will all be given to Professor Vajpay 
uh, to consider. And um, the recording will be made available uh, on the Institute's website, as usual. And uh, lastly, I would like to also thank the co-sponsors, the Institute for South Asia Studies, the Sarah Kailat Chair in Indian Studies, the Tagore Program on Literature, Culture, and Philosophy at UC Berkeley, the Subir and Malini Chowdhury Center for Bangladesh Studies. So thank you, everyone, and um, we'll see you at the next thank event. You. Thank you, thank you. It's my pleasure. <laughs>